in Columbia CSL and to those popping in for the Columbia experience, welcome. It is an honor to be with you this summer fun morning. And it's so good of you to come and get yourself some spiritual nourishment before heading out for the day's adventure. Welcome. This month, we embark on the theme sacred relationship, which at a glance might be read as sacred relationships as we are given to think from a dualistic perspective. But because the science within our teaching affirms that we live in a universe of divine order, expressing as the law of cause and effect, the latter, sacred relationships, must be the effect of its cause, sacred relationship. Sacred relationship, the self-givingness of God creating life out of itself as love, by means of the natural law of its being, is sacred and holy and is immune to tampering. It is the one life that exists, expressing in many ways in our lives through both a time-space continuum and multidimensionally in the eternal now, and is indeed what I like to call a sacred cow. Therefore, our sacred relationship with the ultimate supreme infinite intelligence that lives in and as us is our sacred cow, which is immune from tampering, even by our own thoughts. My message today opens up our exploration of sacred relationship with the concept that there is no other as stated in the fundamental spiritual principles of wholeness and oneness. So let's begin by checking in on our desires in relationships. Whether you desire to create more joy and harmony in a significant relationship, be present with someone you love who is preparing to make their transition, perhaps create a more compassionate and creative workplace environment, or help children to empower themselves or understand how to live guided by spirit. One thing is certain, agreement must be first made in the understanding that the otherness is a construct in our own mind. Dr. Kathy Ann Lewis shared something in the Minister's Connection thread this week that I felt was relevant. She said there was a poignant moment in the movie Doctor Strange when the Ancient One, discussing a previous student, said, He only wanted a healing, but these energies aren't for just us. It's never about just us. And Dr. Kathy Ann goes on to say that some people have thought our teaching too self-serving, maybe because we put too much emphasis on how the science of mind can change our life. But that's only the beginning. Once we become comfortable with allowing the law of cause and effect to work through us, we know we are here to be a force for good in the world and make our portion of the world a better place. At Columbia, our center carries a vision that states contributing to a world that works for everyone. And so how we mindfully align our energy with the energetic nature of this universe will determine the outcome for so many. So let's pause for this moment together as one humanity here by choice and sit in the silence and contemplate our oneness. Firstly, I invite you to really see yourself. Then observe how you begin to see others. Now, can you say, I see you? I use my eyes to recognize your beauty. Let me be the mirror of love. One of my favorite poems to recite 
uh, for couples at weddings, usually those more mature couples who've been married once before or at least have a lot of relationship experience, is written by a poet named Gabriel Fitzmorris and is entitled In the Midst of Possibility. Now I love you free of me. In this loving, I can see the you apart from me. The you of you that is ever free. This is the you I love. This is the you I'll never have. This is the you beyond possession. The you that is ever true while ever changing, ever new. Now, naked, free, the you of you meets the me of me. And to see is to love, to love, to see in the midst of possibility, we agree. There is no other. When we enter the state of relatedness, we are brought closer to others, to life and to ourselves, together with soft edges merging as one. In this feeling of intense belonging, we come to understand the words of the master teacher Jesus when he said, when you make the two one, and when you make the inner as the outer and the outer as the inner and the above as the below and when you make the male and female into a single one then shall you enter the kingdom i think it is one thing to identify our co-creative role as being accountable for the part we played in relationship and another to take responsibility and implement a change that is needed in our new awareness we have learned to do and say whatever is expedient in the moment to keep safe, perhaps save ourselves problems, or perhaps save ourselves the energy and effort in changing. Self-improvement and safety have become our motivators to a greater or lesser degree in the areas of our lives where we are not comfortable. These choices generally result in becoming another's judge and jury when we're not getting what we want. And if we pause to look at the law of cause and effect again, we will see it states that we are always getting easily what is ours by right of our own consciousness. When we are coming to the understanding that there is no other but a corresponding energetic match to our thought emotion state of being, we begin to turn blame inward in a conscious way. Now, interestingly enough, it is our inward blame that began the whole cycle in the first place. But now that we're aware of it, we can create an intention that will walk with us to the next level of awareness and our becoming. You know, personally, when I became a minister I really hadn't thought it out clearly of what it might be like to be a spiritual leader, one who is both obligated and credited to teach principle by how I live, speak, and act. Now, the good news for me and for all of us is that we're always growing and expanding our alignment with our divine nature, same as everyone else. And when one has the courage to speak their truth and ask for what they want in relationship, and that in and of itself is their growing edge, that kind of vulnerability and courage invites others to meet them with their own growing edge, to be heard and accepted too. And voila, the sacredness and relationship is being cultivated. Now, it was a long time ago that I saw the movie Avatar. I always promised myself I'd see it again. I never did, but I do remember this part. That there is a greeting that expresses the nature and naturalness of peace. And the people of that distant planet knew themselves as one life, one organism, one truth. So whenever two people met, their greeting was, I see you. 
When we can live in that unshakable sense of oneness, when we no longer need to remind ourselves that there is no place where God ends and we start, no place where we end and God starts, then we too will greet each other with this acknowledgement. I see you. And peace will be fully, completely, irrevocably revealed on earth. And we shall acknowledge ourselves as that force for good. I think this is the root of the spiritual journey, to know ourselves as one, without exception. To open, to be willing to lay down what is not working, and learn how to expand our perspective on what is possible by means of me. To be fearless, to ask those deeper questions of the wisdom that lies at the core of us, that will lead us to birthing a greater expression and therefore experience of ourselves. This sacred relationship is found through subtraction, not addition. And by understanding that the love we seek in our life is never found outside of us. So as we hold ourselves sacred, it certainly lessens the temptation of what I like to refer to as doing drive-by relationships and instead set up our conversations and our communications well, where we're centered and calm enough in our own self-knowing so that we may first be prayerful, inviting in sacredness, inviting in kindness and safety for all in the conversation. So let me ask you this question. What do you identify with, your personality or your soul? God is everywhere present, so everything is sacred work, especially when our focus is on our soul, a spiritual being full of choice, awareness, and the capacity to create anything in a moment. I want to share a story with you now. Um, a Zen story. They're beautiful teaching stories, and this is how this one goes. There was once a well-educated, highly successful man who went to visit a Zen master to ask for solutions to his problems. As the Zen master and the man conversed, the man would frequently interrupt the Zen master to interject his own beliefs, not allowing the Zen master to finish many sentences. So finally, the Zen master just stopped talking and offered the man a cup of tea instead. When the Zen master poured the tea, he kept pouring after the cup was full, causing it to overflow. The man stopped pouring, he said. The cup is full. The Zen master stopped and said, Similarly, you too are full of your own opinions. You want my help, but you have no room in your own cup to receive my words. The moral of the story is a reminder that our beliefs are not us. When we unconsciously hold on to our beliefs, we become rigid and close-minded to learn and expand our consciousness. The path of self-realization is to obviously stay conscious of our beliefs and always be open to the learning. You know, we're called to develop qualities and talents and capacities that can't otherwise come forward, a gift of the unfoldment of our own soul. This is why considering spiritual practices, including prayerful thought and action before our communication and conversation in relationships, helps us to lean into the unity and oneness of life's mystery, spontaneity, and life's expression all at the same time. The law of cause and effect are one action, one constant momentum of energy expressing at different vibratory levels, ether and substance, spiritual power expressing as human power. So where do we begin? And I know you all know what I'm going to say. We start where we are, 
with what is working, meaning giving us more aliveness instead of from what we choose that takes life away from us that we want to escape. Next, we set to become an apprentice of self-appreciation instead of self-aggrandizement or self-improvement so as not to remain divided against ourselves. There is no other. We are one with the stars, the dreams, each other, and the infinite creator. Any body of individuals, like a community or organization or a party, has a collective unconscious at work. All the while, they, as members, make plans, goals, and such to better their position in the world. Some are motivated to be more, to do more, to get more. Some are motivated to give more. Either way, the co collective unconscious of the group will determine the result of the group. So the ways of cultivating sacred relationship promotes the observance of right alignment towards conscious evolution and manifestation as congruent with the nature or qualities of life itself. So if your organization or your community, or if you as an individual are feeling a bit adrift, lost, maybe reactive, maybe hopeless, even victimized, Remember that we can always turn to the principle of oneness to begin to consciously move our thought and feelings in awareness of the fact that there is only one mind or God is all there is and breathe into the choice of how we wish to think with that one mind. Here is when we reaffirm our wholeness and divine humanity and reconnect in a sacred relationship with ourself as the one. This is not a journey of eliminating any part of the whole. It is a conscious journey of observing and recognizing the beauty and intelligence and perfection of what is, and then deciding if we want to be in sacred relationship with it. I think poet Nancy Wood speaks wonderfully to the perfect growth and movement of conscious evolution in her poem called The Circles of Life. Take a listen. You shall ask, what good are dead leaves? And I will tell you, they nourish the sore earth. You shall ask, what reason there is for winter? And I will tell you, to bring about new leaves. And you shall ask, why are the leaves so green? And I will tell you, because they are rich with life. You shall ask, why must summer end? And I will tell you, so that the leaves can die. The cycle of seasons does not promise to be easy. It does, however, promise to transform us. Consciously experiencing previously hidden aspects of the cycle gives us a new wisdom from which to begin each day, letting us know that life in its wisdom is living us and that nothing has gone wrong. So set our hearts ablaze with desire for a universe that gives us unconditionally anything we put our mind and heart in union to create. Now, did you think any more about what you identify with, your personality or your soul? Either way, what makes your heart sing? When you become the energy of your heart song, you are experiencing the wholeness of being. Your being and therefore the sacred relationship with the infinite all. As you expand your acceptance of the all good as your true birthright, there is even more wholeness to experience. And in this state of consciousness born from living your heart song, there is nothing greater or lesser, no past and future. There is no interest in being anywhere other than where you are. When our perceptions of self is whole, 
And we are giving ourselves wholly into life. Nothing else exists. There is no other. But there is finally peace. Finally joy. And finally freedom. Return to the One. Rejoice in the One. The sacred relationship of time immemorial. Let me be the mirror of love. And so it is. And so we are. Amen.